we've been hearing all about the airplanes. You don't hear much about the fact that it's a stealth airplane, uh, probably because stealth is so secretive and top secret, it never gets mentioned. But this was really groundbreaking for the uh, stealth world. And Ed Lovick has been mentioned, so they did stealth work on the U-2 before it was done on the A-12. And uh, when you sell the government, you're going to build an airplane with a small cross-section. How are you going to prove it? You're going to have to measure it. How are you going to measure it? Uh, there was nothing to measure it with. So uh, Lincoln Labs people designed a ground range where you put models on poles on a dry lake bed and measure the cross-section. And uh, you, we did that with the full-scale model and small models, too. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of it was cut and dry, a bit of beer for you, this will work, a bit of beer, that will work. And uh, there are a lot of very smart people that gave up when they don't like betting on beers. They like to have math to prove it. Uh, and so the way to finally verify it was, Lockheed took the wings off of U-2 and uh, put them in, a, I think, a 124, flew it up to the site, put the wings back on, and it was modified so you could put it on a rotator that sits on top of a 52-foot pole and we measured its cross-section by rotating it. And then they took it back to Burbank and did whatever they did with it. We had a telemetry package that we uh, used to fly with the Nikani back down to Burbank to put in a U-2. Uh, I was the unfortunate engineer doing that job. <laughs> Loading up my stuff, going down to Burbank. We couldn't track it when I got to the site. Oh, you know, put it back in a box, go back up, try and figure out why we couldn't acquire it. We finally found the, the reason. But the idea was that we could then compare what we call flight to ground cross sections to make sure that when you measured it in the sky, you get the same numbers as measuring it on the ground. And then we actually did put, or Lockheed actually did put a real A-12 on the pole. Uh, Luther McDonald was the, the chief of the uh, RCS bunch at Lockheed. And I remember him saying, Kelly told me I got $17 million on the pole and I better not drop it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was modified enough that you could put the uh, rotator into it. And the rotator was literally clobbered together and invented by Lockheed. And uh, it's still used at the uh, ranges down at Alamogordo, White Sands, the government owns and used at Lockheed's Hellendale Range because you're rotating 30,000 pounds with a box about two feet in diameter, it's round and about. 10 inches deep and it rotates a 30,000 pound airplane and tilts it up and down. And so then, after we put it on the pole, flight tests went into two phases. There was the aero operate, flight handling and op operating qualities and RCS. Uh, most of the stories have been hearing about the operations aspect. And uh, the Lockheed test pilots typically flew the uh, RCS airplanes. It was usually almost any test program is going to be a dedicated RCS airplane, or maybe a dedicated flutter airplane for Aero, that type of thing. The government and the contractors always negotiate how many airplanes are test and how much are going to be actually bought for pilots. And so I was usually working with Daryl Greenemeyer and, and Bill Parks and Bill Gilliman, because if you do the Lockheed work as opposed to the operation stuff like Sam did. Uh, and so we went through a series of bumps, failures, so that we could acquire the airplane, because we had to pick it up as it was coming back to base on Mach 3. So you don't have much time to lock on, because the horizon's about two or three hundred miles away, and he's going to be on top of you pretty quick, and that's the only time you get to measure RCS, or to gather radar data. You put the data into a computer and it measures the RCS. So that's what we did. We ended up having a, uh, first we were going to acquire the airplane with uh, the telemetry, like 400 megs. And uh, the idea was you put four antennas on the lower lip of the dish, 60-foot dish, and you use those as a monopulse receiver. You need four of them so you can compare phases to know which way you should point to acquire the target. And I spent more time on my back trying to phase balance that system before it came on to everybody that the ground plane and ground bounces so much when you're looking at the horizon, you don't know where you're supposed to look because you get multiple path propagation. And that ain't going to work. Oh, okay. So we put an X-band transponder in the Blackbird. And that was fun getting an antenna that would hold together at the temperatures because it was hanging right up in the airstream with the Q-bay. And uh, we had human operators and a Nike. One guy did it. We were aware of the flight paths. We knew when he was coming in the horizon. When he was, he'd call him to the base. We were in on the deck. 
we being the EG&G people on the range. And uh, okay, he's coming over the horizon, and the guy had turned his cranks you know, back and forth, literally on the horizon. Oh, there he is, you know, turns a couple more cranks and pushes a button, he's locked on. And that's the way we actually acquired and trapped. Uh, and if you didn't get him by 100 miles, his elevation angle has changed so fast that uh, I know one guy that did it, Colin Dawson. <laughs> he was crank. The Army uses three operators in their Nikes. This Nike is modified by us with one operator because the computer kept track of range. And that one operator took the azimuth and elevation game and it was a crank like mad. And that was the way the RCS was measured. And like I said, then we put it into a computer that we built for the program. And uh, that's how we verified that the RCS met the goals that it was supposed to do. Thank you, uh, Wayne. I think everybody knew that despite those good RCS numbers, uh, we still tracked pretty easily. The radar is that, that uh, pardon me? Radar cross-section. Yeah, yeah, RCS is radar cross-section. And uh, I had never gotten, received the numbers of the U.S. radars, but uh, there was a, a radar station on the top of Mount Charleston called the Angels Peak. And every time that thing took off, it locked on. There was a I forget which squadron it was in those days, Air Defense Squadron, station of Reno, and they'd see the sucker coming. And all high flying airplanes at the time, uh, well, all airplanes at the time, carried an IFF. Well, the IFF on the A 12 was modified to a test boat that once went through at 60,000 feet. A normal IFF wouldn't interrogate. So Turned people at LAX couldn't see it. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, Thank you, Wayne. I think we have time for one last question. We have someone up here. And then